Welcome to another episode of the Fertility Conversations podcast. Today, we're joined by a lovely guest, Julia Paget. Julia is an established IVF clinic founder, international fertility business consultant, and embryologist. She has worked in over 15 IVF con- uh, clinics worldwide and has helped 10, 000, over 10,000 patients to conceive thousands of babies. Now, Julia leads the IVF Guide, the first global platform for of independent IVF professionals offering unbiased advice and support directly to fertility patients. Julia is passionate about ensuring that everyone on a fertility journey is given the absolute best and safest chance to achieve a pregnancy without paying over the odds and without getting lost in the system. Originally from the UK, Julia Julia now lives in sunny Spain. So welcome, Julia, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Ola. Thanks for having me. Yay. How is it there in Spain? It's hot, actually. Yeah, it's hot. It's lovely. Nice. I'm I'm warm. (laughs) (laughs) How's it in London? (laughs) It's it's great. Well, it's not sunny. (laughs) It's cold and wet. But hey, that's London. It is. Yeah. Looking forward to the summer days. Um, So... Thank you so much for joining us today and I really appreciate all that you're doing because when I read your bio, it's really amazing what you've accomplished over the years. Um, to start off, you know, just can you please tell us a little bit, a, a little bit about yourself, uh, your background and how you transitioned from being an embryologist into a founder or business Yeah. Owner? Sure. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me on. It's very exciting. Um, Yeah, so I'm originally from the UK. I grew up on the Isle of Wight on a farm and uh, so very rural and then went to live, uh, studied in, studied zoology in London. So kind of got the big city thing and and wanted to stay in cities. Um, I went to East Africa for a while as uh, like past post university to work in conservation I was sure I did a zoology degree and I was like oh I want to work in conservation got myself a kind of volunteered job in Tanzania and during that time became really disillusioned with where the money was going in conservation and I was like you know I'm not I'm not sure about this you know I'm not sure about this is what I want to do and when I came back to the UK um, a guy that had moved into my flat share was an embryologist and this was must have been about 93, 94. Um, so I'd never heard of that back then. Obviously, I've had test tube babies, hadn't heard of an embryologist, had a chat with this guy, and it just blew my mind. I was like, wow, this is this is what I want to do. And of course, back then it was all so much easier. I mean, I thought it was difficult at the time because I had to <laughs> write, you know, 20 letters, but I wrote 20 letters, got a job in um in Manchester, purely, I think, because I had just come back from. East Africa and the guy there was South African and we had a little bit Ah. of a little bit of a Swahili chat (laughs) nice I mean you'd never get into embryology (laughs) these days in that way so I was really lucky I got into IVF got my first job in Manchester and then I was I mean I've been so lucky in my career an American girl um, who was extremely experienced had come over for a kind of a sabbatical work experience in in Mm -hmm. in England and she hooked me up with a job in New York, which, you know, 24 years old, uh, this, this amazing job in New York. So at 24, after two years in the UK, I was out working in America. And I think this transition to working in America as a Brit is really mind blowing. There's a very, very different culture out there of uh, very much a meritocracy. If you work hard, you climb really quickly. So um, my career just really catapulted quite quickly once I was in New York. So I was there for four years and then I transferred to New Zealand um, because my sister was in New Zealand. And um, there's a whole sort of personal background, but maybe I won't go into that, (laughs) sort of boyfriends and things like that. And uh, ended up in New Zealand and um, uh, I ran a lab there for a while. Then uh, came back to the UK because I'd actually met my husband in America and he was there Ah. in the UK. So I came back to the UK, uh, dabbled in osteopathy for a while because actually I thought I didn't want to work in IVF in the UK anymore because um, it's just like really big differences in how it operates in different countries. 
Um, but I did end up back in, in IVF, worked at the Lister Hospital for a while and then ended up being really lucky that um, there was kind of a, an opportunity to start an IVF centre in Southampton. A doctor um, that I was working with was like, you know, look, we're sitting on this referral stream for the NHS. Um, it's all going down the road to a private clinic. Let's see if the NHS want to, you know, we can bring some value to the NHS by having it kept in house um, if we partner with them. So we did a really complicated private public partnership and got investment from the NHS to build uh, what's now Complete Fertility Centre Southampton. Um, I was still an embryologist. I was running the lab, um, but I was also building the clinic, doing the website, hiring people, setting up the finance systems. So it was all very challenging. And around that time, well, so probably after about five years, I transitioned out of the lab to be just the business director, although I would occasionally still go into the lab. And I was still, you know, an extremely experienced clinical person in the clinic. So I would often get or always get like really challenging um, issues when, you know, when anything went wrong or when there was a patient that was really struggling, it would always end up on my plate. And I think that's because I wanted it to, because I knew that I, I really connect. I, I'm a people person, you know, I love connecting mm. with people. I love hearing their stories and I want to help them. And, um, and it was always my passion that if, if I had my own clinic, I wanted it to be that if anyone came through the door, we were going to treat them as if they were my sister or the nurse's sister or my best friend, you know, like, what is it you would want to give for them? How do you make them have the best, the absolute best chance of getting pregnant? Um, but of course, running a business, it is challenging. You know, you've got thousands of patients churning through, you've got staff, you've got, you can't manage every single detail, um, right. unless you're a micromanager and that's not nice <laughs> either, you know? And, uh, so anyway, I was there for a number of years and we ended up selling that clinic to Virtus Health, which you may have heard of. They're the largest provider of IVF in Australia. Mm -hmm. And they're one of the largest in the world uh, in terms of cycle numbers because they've got clinics through Europe as well. So we became their first UK clinic. And um, and that was amazing, suddenly being part of a big global group, the big global network. And then I took a role with them that was based in Singapore, um, setting up their uh, consulting services. So when large hospital groups come to a big organization like Birdis Health and say, we want IVF, how do we put that in? Then that was, those were my projects. Um, and then that transitions to uh, helping support acquire clinics. So mergers and acquisitions. So super interesting business stuff, but all in Southeast Asia. But at this point I was working remotely from the UK thinking I was going to move to Singapore, but it was around COVID time. And they were like, you know what, you're doing the job fine. Just stay where you are. Um, and keep doing the job. And I thought, well, hang on, I'm working remotely after so many years, uh, you know, having to go into a clinic. Let's let's take make the most of this. So I upped the family and moved to Spain. So that's how I've ended up in Spain, still working remotely. So then, you know, to get to how we got to the IVF guide, um, yeah. we uh, I, I left that job and thought, how do I keep working globally? Because I've been working globally for so long. And I know that, um, you know, for years you have patients, uh, friends of friends contact you. If you're an embryologist or a fertility nurse or you work in the fertility space, and I'm sure you have this all the time, people reaching out to you going, what do I do? You know, I'm having this, this treatment in these clinics. What's my next step? What just happened? What went wrong? And I know that when I help those people or my colleagues, friends help those people. They tend to have a better experience because they've got somebody on the inside, but we're not aligning with any one clinic. We're not saying you've got to go to this clinic. That clinic is the only way to do it. We know that, especially from, I mean, I've worked in so many clinics around the world. Each clinic is very different. They're all amazing for different reasons, but depending on what you need, and I know you know this as well, because we've yeah. talked about it depending on what you need personally, what your relationship status is, whether you need donor eggs, whether you need donor sperm, whether you need genetic testing, whether you're a bit older or you actually don't mind paying paying over the odds for, for a lot of additional things, or you're really looking for a clinic that has that extra support and you don't mind so much about donor because that's not relevant for you. It really does depend on your situation where the right clinic for you is. And you shouldn't need to be traveling for it, but there's also options abroad if you want to look at different pricing options or different donor options or different um, access to different kind of tests or services that different countries don't do. 
So I thought, well, I can provide this service, but I'm just one person and I obviously don't know every clinic. So I started reaching out to my network of great friends that I've worked with along the way, initially just embryologists. And everyone was like, this is amazing. You know, we want to join. We want to join. If you're going to get us, you know, access to these patients, we know we can give so much, especially embryologists that are stuck in the IVF labs doing IVF and ICSI all the time. (laughs) They are so brilliantly clever. They know, not me, because I came into it 30 years ago. Nowadays, when they come into it, they are so highly, highly educated in the full fertility pathway. And they love talking to patients, but they're in the lab and and they're not they don't have access to the patients very easily. When patients get access to them, they love it. Um, But so so what I'm trying to do is provide a platform of getting embryologists in front of patients. And now I've added infertility nurses because they're amazing, too. And I, I know so many of them. And before I knew it, I've got 100 people on this global platform. We're in 15 countries, six continents. And it's yeah, it's just it's going really fast and it's really exciting. So that's the (laughs) the synopsis. Yeah, that's where we're at. Yeah, (laughs) that's amazing, actually. And it really is a good idea because I think oftentimes we for even, for example, embryologists, we always think they're just in the lab, right? We never see them. We just see the doctors and the nurses. The embryologists are back there doing what they do. Uh, So you now bringing them to the front of the patient. I think that's pretty interesting because many fertility patients associate embryologists with the lab that's it yeah yeah so what else will they be bringing to the table by having embryologists yeah so it's really interesting because actually if you go under the cover in any IVF clinic you'll find that the embryologists tend to be doing almost everything I mean certainly in my clinic we were running the clinic right because I'm an embryologist I was running the clinic the embryology team were my right hand team and I've seen this in every clinic I've worked in the doctors are obviously front and center they're the names in the clinic they're highly you know they're, they're essential obviously they're so important but when they lean on the process it's the embryologists often that are putting the pathways in place organizing the meetings telling you know whoever which patient needs to be spoken to about what they are the background of of any IVF clinic and certainly in the UK I think embryologists are more much more front and center they they do meet the patients they spend there's a lot of clinics now have embryology consultations but it's so much more than the embryos like we don't talk about just the embryos we have to know the full fertility pathway Um, And we're probably the only people in the clinic that know that full pathway, because as as amazing as the doctors and nurses are, they obviously don't know exactly what happens in the IVF lab, whereas we know what happens in the IVF lab and we see everything else that happens, too, if you know what I mean. So we are very, very well versed in that whole process. So in terms of what we're offering with the IVF guide, it's, it's not just about we're going to talk about your embryos. Yes, we can do that because that's important. But more importantly, really, is where are you going? Uh, what tests are you having? Who do you need to speak to? Are you are you lost in the system? That's what we hear all the time. You know, look, I've been waiting for a test for so long or this clinic. Uh, I don't even know uh, whether this clinic will do what I need because they're telling me I have to go for an appointment to even find out. And then, well, right. you've spent that money on that doctor. You've then financially and emotionally invested in that clinic. It's unlikely you're then going to say, well, actually, no, I don't want to go here. But you don't exactly. know whether that clinic can offer you what you need until you've spent that money. Whereas through this network that we now have, say if you were in Nigeria, for example, I could be like, okay, well, I know that there's these three clinics in in Lagos and we've got these people in these clinics and which clinics are you interested in? Okay, we're going to connect with those clinics too. And then we go under the cover. We can go to the lab managers, the fertility nurses, the lead of genetics and talk to those clinics, find out exactly what's going on in them, exactly what you're going to pay. Do they offer you what you need to offer? And then we'll also get a discount for you. We hope we, most clinics will, will get discounts because of course all these clinics are saying to us, Oh yeah, Julie, we'll, we'll give you some money if you send us patients. Cause that's how pipelines work. And I'm like, right. that sounds great, but that is now the patient discount because we want to be completely unbiased. We don't want to be saying that any clinic is paying us. So any, um, kickback or or uh, or offer that a clinic will give we're asking that to be a patient discount for our clients so the idea being that, that we'll save the patients money because we'll get them discounts we'll also save them money by supporting them not having um, tests that they don't need or accessing 
national health set, like for example, in the UK, a lot of the stuff you, you need for an IVF clinic can be done in the NHS before you get there. But of course, a clinic is it's not in their favor to say you could go back to your GP. I mean, they do. They are often very transparent in, in all fairness. They do say you could go to your GP and get this, but some clinics might not. Or you, by the time you've got there, you may just be like, OK, I'll just spend the money and, and exactly. to get quicker. But we can help you find out, OK, you, you can get this done with your GP, but you don't need that done. And for this clinic, you don't need to have those kind of tests first, et cetera. So we can save you money in that way. We can save you time because we're going to get you where you need quicker. And a lot of people, I find, are, are really stuck in the system doing things that they don't need to be doing because their local doctor that isn't a fertility expert, like their GP, for example, says, oh, you need this, this and this, and you've got to go to this hospital and have this scan and then wait six months for that result. And actually for what they need, it's not relevant to their treatment pathway. But so they're kind of not getting focused um, information. And then right. we also say we save you stress because we're going to be like your buddy. It's like your support person through it. That's like your friend, but is an expert. And it, and we're never going to be sort of saying, oh, the clock's ticking. You've only got an hour with us. You know, if you if you have appointments with us, it's as much time as you need, as much access as you need, et cetera. That sounds amazing. And actually, it is really good to hear that because, I mean, the kind of support you're providing. Because when you think about it, when you noted earlier that waiting with a doctor, maybe a GP for six months for one test or, or, or the other, six months is a long time for someone trying to do yeah. fertility treatments. It can make yeah, a it's huge awful. difference. Yeah, so, you don't want to see people waiting six months. That's exactly. not cool. That's not cool on a fertility journey. Your biological clock is, is ticking, you know, and we all know that and you know it more than anyone. And so by the time you then get to that first appointment, you are so stressed and so anxious because there's been so much build up just to get that one appointment with the doctor. And yeah. then we find, well, you go into that appointment with the doctor and when you come out, you're like, I don't know what he or she just said to me because you're so, it's so yeah. huge. Right. And that's why we can be there either on speakerphone for your appointments. So we can ah. listen. We're not going to, we're not going to interrupt that doctor. We don't want to make him or her feel uncomfortable. We're not there to question the doctor. We are purely supportive but we'll be listening so that afterwards when you're like, I don't know what happens. We're like, okay, so this is what they explained to you. We can ask if we think something's not been covered, we can raise a hand and say, Oh, could you just tell her this or that, yeah. you know, but equally we're there as a, as a calm expert pair of ears. I mean, we can even go physically to the appointment if you want us to, but in theory, we can just be on your speakerphone. It's a lot easier for you. And then we can just decode that for you afterwards. Okay. Right. You know, this is what happened. This is what you need to do. You're going to see the nurse. So we're just there as your friend. It's almost like an extra partner, especially for single women that are going through this. I know single women often have a mom or a sister or a friend that might do it with them. And that's great. But we could also be that person if they don't want to be sharing or they don't have that extra yeah. person. And I've definitely met them along the way. I've met the single women that don't have the support person. And I know they need so much more and different kind of support. They don't have someone to go home with and talk it through and, you know, so we can be their partner through it, you know. Wow. That's a pretty cool uh, addition to actually what you're offering, because, again, oftentimes when you go as a fertility patient to the, to the clinic, uh, you even if you have a partner, you might not go with that partner. And even even if you do go, sometimes you're just both. You're both overwhelmed. In your mind, overwhelmed. You're not mm. really listening and you're not mm. really asking. You don't even know what the right question to ask is. Exactly. So, Exactly. I mean, I've been there for other different types of appointments, but I, I just, I know, I know, I mean, we would always get those, you know, I've had, I, whenever I speak to a patient, it's, yeah, well, I had a doctor appointment. I don't really know what happened. I think we're doing IVF, you know, and then they'll wait for the nurse call. And obviously they won't, you know, the, the clinic will pick them up. But that stress, that anxiety, we know that's not helping your situation. Yeah. We want to keep you as calm as possible. We know how, uh, the, the stress is so enormous through it, right? And um, we I, I can't say I can take that away because we can't, but just, just know that you've got somebody, when you're trying to call your clinic and they don't answer because all clinics are so busy that sometimes you've got to wait. If we could take that off you and just say, okay, well, I'll call the clinic. If you've got a question, if I don't know the answer, which we, we may just know the answer straight away because it's just a, a normal standard question. But if it's like I've run out of medication um, or I'm, bleeding and you know what should I do we we can take that off you we can be the person between the clinic 
and just be right in there because we'll, you know, we, it's just easier for us to manage. And so it's like, you've got your personal nurse or embryologist with you on the phone through your whole cycle. We're not charging you by the hour. It's just a set fee. And we hope that that takes the pressure off. The other thing that we're, we're really excited about is we're developing an app. And we really oh. think this is going to be a game changer because yes. we're so global. We've got this app coming where you will literally, anyone on a fertility journey can go into the app, first of all, for free, just get a lot of information as you would anywhere about IVF. And then you've got a question. You're like, hmm, I've got a question. You just pay a really small amount and you can ask a chat, like a chat question. And um, that will initially go to the IVF guides in your country if they don't pick it because they'll have said they're available. Right. And um, if they're not available, say it's the middle of the night, it will go wider to your continent. And then if it's still like for any reason, they're, they're not available, it'll go wider to the world. And hopefully, so people are saying it's like the Uber of fertility because whoever yeah. picks it up, yeah. will, you know, they'll be your IVF guy. And because we're vetting everybody, okay? So everybody has to speak English, obviously, as a, as a, as a baseline, but we've got so many different languages on the, on the system. It's wonderful because we've got all these different countries. They've all got to have had at least five years post-qualifying experience as a nurse or a fertility nurse or, not, or as an embryologist. They've all got to have worked in at least two IVF clinics. And then, of course, according to their country, we're making sure they've got the right registration, qualifications, et cetera. The people I'm meeting are amazing. I mean, they're just absolutely wonderful. And most people have got 15, 20 years experience because they're so interested in doing something a bit different. You know, they've been working yeah. in their IVF clinics for a long time. This isn't necessarily attracting the younger people because they're happy learning the ropes in the IVF clinics we're attracting the people that have been in it 20 25 years they they're sort of thinking about what's my next step do i have to keep commuting i'd really like to work remotely so we're getting amazing i mean really big names in IVF are joining the program um, and our platform so no matter who your answer is from it's going right. to be someone extremely reputable extremely experienced so that's really exciting and then on the app if you uh, you have your, your small questions answered and you think this is really cool and you can scroll through all the IVF guides, you can look for um, specialisms, whether you want a nurse, embryologist, you want someone knows knows about genetics or donor or anything specific, research, anything specific to you. And you say, yeah, I like the look of her or him. I'll, I want to work with him. And then you pay a little bit more and you then have full access for a month to that IVF guide, um, video calls, as many as you want for that price. Because we believe that, no one's really going to want to talk to someone for more than three hours. So we, right. we're literally right. saying, we're not saying you get two appointments or 10 appointments. It's just, if you want to see them every night or three times a day for the next month, go for it because that is your, that's what you get as part right. of this. And then when you've, uh, when you've selected that option, you then also get access to these discounts and we want to have discounts with more than 50% of the world's providers. So not just IVF clinics, but semen analysis tests, uh, blood tests, ultrasound scans. Oh, all tests, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so wherever you are, we'll always give you at least three options for any of those things and uh, hopefully a discount so that we're never saying, yes, if you need a semen analysis, you've got to use this provider or you need right. a doctor, you see that doctor. We'll always give you three of what we believe is the best option. And it won't just be this one person making that decision either because we've got these clinical governance committees in each territory so that say you came to me in Lagos again and said, for example, yeah. and said, um, OK, I, I'm seeing this IVF guide. I want treatment there. That IVF guide would then take it back to our Africa committee who would say and, and say, OK, I'm looking at these clinics for Ola. What do you think? And then that committee would say, OK, well, have you tried this, this and this? Because I know these clinics and these doctors. So we've got this by uh, by contacting one IVF guide, you've got the network. And it will be constantly reviewed. Are you feeding back? Are you building that information back? So each client is actually getting access to the world's yes. IVF yeah. guys. So we think it's pretty cool. I think it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love the sound of it. And even when you speak about spermostimin analysis, so with you having that guide and all of that, if a patient, for example, is needing or they're dealing with male factor infertility, you can then say, you can then perhaps advise them on the clinics that have special uh, specialties in that area Absolutely. so that way you know to only go to those clinics as opposed to exactly. finding out much later yeah and what we're finding is because we are attracting 
the top people in the game, in the field. I mean, we're getting, you know, top andrologists, top embryologists, top geneticists. So if even, it doesn't matter where you are, if, if you're in Mexico, we have people that are so global and so eminent in the field that we can say, look, this person has a really specific issue right. with their sperm. You know, it's quite rare or it's quite, well, that just goes straight to, the most eminent person that we've got, you know, and then they feed back, oh yeah, I know, oh, they're in Mexico. Okay, yeah, no, I know I have these contacts. I have this, this, and this. So it's crazy what we're delivering. I mean, just our WhatsApp group alone is blowing <laughs> everybody's mind because we are suddenly, instead of us all being working for different clinics, we're suddenly part of this incredible world organization. People are calling it their family already. It's so exciting. Um, so, okay. so from our side, we're loving it. And we hope that, I love it. You know, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're just trying to get the word out because it's very difficult to it's one of these services that is actually so exciting, but actually quite hard to distill into a nutshell. You know, I've been yeah. talking 20 minutes because there's just so many and then there's this and there's this and there's this. So we're trying to kind of get it really clear messaging, but it's quite yeah. hard to um, make it really clear. What is it we're actually doing? Yeah, which is great. I think it seems almost like you're. Uh, fertility support the coach but also knowledgeable for fertility uh, professionals right you can provide information about the clinic to choose you can advise them in terms of uh you know even when they have questions for the doctors what questions to ask and and that's that's a whole lot that's what people need when you're going through fertility treatments because there's so many questions so many concerns you need to feel like you have some kind of person that understands but yeah. understands from the professional part of it and can yeah. advise you how to go. Yeah, because there's a lot do. of confusion out there. There you know? is. There's, there's just so much out there. And it's I know that there's so much you know, amazing offerings out there. But I know if I was a patient, I'd be like, well, where, where do I start? Exactly. Do I, do I start with the, the special juice? Do I start with the <laughs> I know. Do I start with the mindfulness? I mean, That's it's, a all, great. it's yeah. all great. It's all good. But it's like, but you know, what, what do I, what do I really need? Or I haven't got much money or I actually have loads of money and I'm happy to spend, you know, so we can, we can support with, you know, well, what's right for you. What, what are you exactly. needing? What is specific for you? Not for your friend, not yeah. for that person you heard about. Yeah. And your for budget. You. Yeah. And, and yeah. Exactly. And then the other, we're, we're, we're so excited as well that it's not maybe so relevant for, for your audience, but we, uh, or maybe you do, you have an audience of, uh, of clinics as well. I don't know, but we are yeah. also providing professional services to clinics because of course we've got all these embryologists and nurses and we're like, look, you know, we can provide outsourcing. So these right. people want to work remotely. Um, nurses and embryologists can do so much work outside of the clinic. So we're also supporting with that kind of um the the outsourcing support stuff for clinics too which is which is really cool because that's kind of quite novel too for, yeah. for people to be working remotely in that way so yeah well wow, sounds really exciting and for people that are listening and wanting to reach out to you what's the best way to reach you at the ivf guide yes yeah, so they uh they can find us on instagram the dot ivf dot guide or um uh my whatsapp uh six eight uh sorry plus three four because i'm in spain six eight three one three three seven seven nine nine or our website is uh ivfguide.co.uk we are going to be changing that because it doesn't sound good at being a uk mm -hmm. website but yeah. this is what started you know it started with just me and then suddenly yeah. you're like okay i'm global like everybody <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really yeah. set out to do that so we, I've got a domain name dot life but I haven't okay. got to transfer it over yeah okay sounds great I'll put all the details in the show notes so people can Thank reach you. out to you um you. and I know that you noted earlier we talked about the fact that you've worked in over 15 IVF clinics across the globe mm. so what would you say as some of the differences in patient outcomes based mm. on the country and what's been your experience yeah it's interesting it's very different. I mean, you would know that even in any country, there's a huge range of success rates, right? I think probably in the UK, you could say the success rates span from 20% per cycle uh, per tr embryo transfer, 20% birth, up to something like 60%. I mean, that's yeah, a big that's range, it. right? It now, if you talk to those clinics, say the 20% clinics, it's quite likely they'd be saying, oh, well, we get all the older patients, we get the, 
patients that you know uh, have have gone everywhere else, etc. But our, from my personal experience is the clinics with the best success rates tend to have the trickiest patients because the patients that have tried everywhere else, they're the ones mm. that are really now shopping around. They've had their two, three cycles. They've gone to their local clinic because their doctor or their friend said, oh yeah, the doctor is nice or whatever. Then they're like, okay, I'm still not getting pregnant. What next? What next? This place has got 60%. I'm going to go there. And so those clinics with the 60% rates tend to be, I believe, I mean, obviously there's a big plethora out there, but the ones that I'm aware of and that I've worked with, they are the absolute best because they've got these patients that have had so many cycles elsewhere. Yeah. They are older. They are using, you know, they're using donor sperm and genetics. You know, they've got real complex cases and then they still get the 60% pregnancies or the 40% say in those difficult groups, et cetera. And that, um, that upsets me because there shouldn't be this disparity um, certainly working in America, from my experience, were the best clinics in the world in terms of outcomes. The What I learned there and how uh, how you can manage a fertility patient was wonderful. For my stage of my career, being in my 20s, being exposed to that level of, of detail and perfection and obsession with getting pe- people pregnant um, was totally mind changing for me in terms of what I was wanting to achieve. I've obviously found that difficult because I'm not a doctor. I bring one part of the equation, the lab side of things, and you need every, every part of it to marry up. Um, so certainly for me, America um, was the the pinnacle in terms of outcomes, but those were the clinics that I worked at. I know that there's some clinics that are not so amazing perhaps, but and equally, it's very expensive in America. So one might argue, well, they have the time and the money to put in the extra staff, the time to give that focus. Certainly in the UK, our doctors usually have different commitments with the NHS, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't necessarily get that level of focus or time that perhaps brings everything a bit further up. Now, the standard patient, sta- I know there is no such thing as a standard patient, but for your first cycle or second cycle, then most clinics are probably giving a similar outcome. It's just when it becomes more complicated and you're not getting pregnant, you know, or things don't go well in the cycle. It's like you'll see the clinics that um, get the absolute best success rates are the one that sort of treat the whole system as if it's the Formula One racing car. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, well, if you if you just wax the wheels or if you've got right. a different driver or if you if you change the bonnet to go a bit faster, because you won't necessarily see the difference with it, with the one tiny change. But if you make every tiny change constantly and every day, are you are you honing that racing car, honing, 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 you know, and again, coming back to that, are you treating her like your sister? If that was your sister, you know, is that the time you would do that egg collection? Right. Is that the you know, is that the time you would do the insemination? Would you have been quicker doing that? Would you have made that judgment quicker or answered the phone quicker? Any of those things, you know? So I suppose the other place I can comment on is New Zealand. I worked there. I think working in New Zealand was just fantastic. I mean, I uh, they are so far away. They are f- a five hour flight from Australia. Like when you live on the oh, North wow. Coast. You think it's yeah. just right next door. I know, right? I know. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. You live in the Northern Hemisphere. You're like, oh, Australia, New Zealand is all. It's there, right? You fly over Australia and then you sit on that plane another five hours before you wow. get to New Zealand. I mean, there is nothing around New Zealand. So you kind of think, and then when you get to New Zealand, they're like the coolest, loveliest people. There's something, they call it the Kiwi ingenuity. Like they, they've they had to reinvent the wheel on everything because they can't get supplies in. Like by the mm. time things come in, it rots or it goes off or, you know, so everything you do, you have to kind of think about differently. Um, so when I got there, they were one of, uh, I was working in the capital of New Zealand, Wellington. They were the only clinic in Wellington. They had partner clinics in two other towns and there was only one competitor in the South Island. So they had no competition, right? So many people would be like, well, we've got no competition, doesn't matter. But 
they were obsessed with being the best. They want, because they're so little, because they're so far away, they have this attitude that they want to be a global player. And it, you see that with their prime ministers and, the, you know, they they have big presences in the world stage because they want to be taken very seriously because they are so, they apparently it's got something like the highest percentage of entrepreneurs per capita or innovators, wow. or something, you know, because they're so outward looking because they're so far away. I mean, it's fascinating. So for example, when I was there, I was like, you know, you don't have a heated stage. You know, it's a basic thing in an IVF lab is to keep the embryos warm when they come out of the incubators. And they're like, well, we just have to work really fast, Julian. I was like, no, 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 you've got to have a heated stage. And they're like, we can't afford it. So normally one of these pieces of equipment would be 50,000 pounds at least, something like that. And they sent me this man with a, uh, a little leather bag and a hammer and a welding kit. And he's like, right, what do you need? You know, old glasses and stuff. <laughs> he's like, what do you need? And I'm like, um, well, and I had to draw him a picture of what I needed. And he literally welded me up with a bit of soldering, a, a plate that would go over my microscope to keep the embryos warm. It worked wow. perfectly. It was probably $100 or whatever, you know, and it's like, you know, they have to reinvent the wheel on everything. And so our outcomes were amazing, phenomenal. Love that. Yeah. Not, quite, not quite as high as America, but almost it was up there. And that was a, that I learned so much from that. They were also super switched on in how they looked after their staff, um, how they used the counselor for supporting each other. Um, they placed mm-hmm. huge importance on respect for the local community and the Maori and how we had to they have diff- different beliefs in how we treated the embryos. And it was just, it was really wonderful for me as a sort of little, you know, young person coming from the other side of the world to kind of learn about this different way of working. It's quite wonderful. That so, sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah. I love it. And it's good to see that there's difference in, you know, in each country as there is in different clinics as well. Oh, you um, learn so much from working in different, yeah. And I've worked in Southeast Asia as well. And they were just really cool, very subservient to the doctor the doctor is absolutely in charge you know even though they're absolutely brilliant in the in the lab too but um but yeah it's very very um very much focused on success and uh, but interestingly I thought this was quite interesting is that they're when I said to them so how often you know how do you manage your patient complaints and they're like so this is Singapore they're like our patients don't complain we don't we don't have and you think, well, they must be amazing, right? You know, yeah. But actually, it's because the culture, like in England, I think we're pretty good in the way we look after. We're, we're you know, in comparison to Spain, where the patient uh, doctor relationship is interesting. Say so that there's, they, they don't sort of value the privacy, say so much right. in Spain. You know, it's a little bit un, more undignified the way they treat you here. Uh, but it's wonderful. But but in England, we're very careful about privacy, confidentiality, paperwork, making sure everyone's looked after, well-being's OK. But English people complain a lot. It's just we do. Mm. And um, and if you don't, you know, obviously in, in the field that we work in, if you don't have a baby um, and then something you think, well, they weren't that nice to me at that point. Well, then you might write a letter of complaint. And then that takes up a huge amount of time for the clinic. And that's okay because we're always learning from that and we're getting better and we get that feedback. That's fine. You know, we, we encourage that and support it. In Singapore, that doesn't happen. They just don't wow. complain. It's a, they, they would never raise their hand. So maybe that's not great in some ways because they're not being heard when things aren't, you know, aren't so good. I don't know. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, right? Because... I guess, yeah, you do want to complain or find a way to give your feedback. Be heard, yeah. Yeah, to to say what you felt and what could have been done differently. Exactly. I'm proud of us Brits for being able to (laughs) feed that back. Although on the other side, it can be quite overwhelming. (laughs) Because you start to think you're really bad. You know, you're like, oh God, are we really bad at this? And actually, no, we're not. It's, um, we're just, we're listening. We're listening. That's what it is. And I think for, you know, something like fertility treatments, because everyone comes with different hopes and dreams and the reality that it's not guaranteed, but, you know, people are not going to be happy if the outcome is not what they expected. And it's part it's of hard, the, right? Yeah. It's hard. And the other thing that we know in the field is that fertility patients aren't ill. You know, they they're not like you're not going for heart surgery or cancer yeah. surgery you know most of the time obviously there are cancer patients in there but um so in general you're a well person that has had this awful thing going on with you that is an illness in, in another way but you're physically well and fit and strong and therefore you are you're fighting right you come in you come in 
or you come in excited and then it it can turn to a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, 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 a sort of fight inside you, which is completely understandable because it's like, I need this. I need yeah. this to work. Right. And so when things, when you see something that you don't think was right, it's reasonable to say, well, I don't think that was right because if that took my chance or, you know, exactly, so it's, right. it's fine, you know, so I think you should be heard. I think you should be heard. And, um, and that's what I actually loved. That's the part I loved in my role at Complete Fertility was that I was kind of usually first line for anyone with, you know, a problem or a complaint because I knew I wanted to hear, you know, I wanted to hear that and I wanted to try and help them and unpick it because if someone's not, if it's not going through right, well, yeah. we need to help that. We need to solve that for you. We don't want to be defensive and, and say, oh, we didn't do it. We're, we're going to fix it right now. You know, let's get this right for you. So I, I sort of, I didn't enjoy it necessarily, but I wanted to be that person because I knew that I had that personal need for them to, to have it right, you know, right. rather than be defensive. And that's a great, that's a great energy to take into I, the IVF guide because that's what people need, right? They need people an to hear them. Yeah, an advocate. Yeah. That's yeah it. yeah I, I i i made my family tell me i'm an over empath do you know what i mean <laughs> i'm just like oh my god all the time like i just i feel i get that feeling from people like if you know i it's i just want to make it better i just want to make it better and and i and i'm really proud and and so grateful for the career i've been able to have to help people but i i, I carry with me the people i've not been able to help always and I, you know, when people say, oh, what a rewarding job, I'm always like, no, 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 it's not. It's not because I just see, you know, wherever you work, there's always going to be a chunk of people that don't have a baby. And yeah. that's tragic, you know, to me. And I want to make sure that I can do as much as I can to help them get that baby or find another way if that's not going to happen. You know, I think it's also really important to acknowledge to people that not everyone's going to have a baby. And some people need that support to find a different way or a different life a different manage that grief process and yeah. turn it because you cannot just keep putting yourself through it again and again and again you know you have to there has to be a point um where you come to these decisions and i hope that i'm somebody that i can help people help make those decisions which are really difficult to make yeah. well said uh, but yeah, i love I'm the sorry. fact that mm -hmm. I love the fact that you highlighted that you treat people like, what if that was your sister? What would you do differently? I think that's a good way to look at it because you might just take a little bit extra time. Absolutely. Yeah. She just Always. try to, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a good way to look at it. Because oftentimes we don't, if you look at it as just another patient, it's just another number. But if you look at it as that's, if that was your sister, what would you do? Yeah, what would yeah, you do? I can't, I don't have that ability. And I think most of the people that I work with and that I've brought onto this platform kind of have that too. I think we, there's something about working in this world. Now, of course, there's people that treat it like a job or they find a different joy in it. They love the marvel of embryos, et cetera. But I think the people that have been attracted to join this platform are the ones similar to me. They have this outlook and this way of connecting. They and and it, it may be learned from doing it over time or they've just always been like that. It's just working in this world is just, it's crazy what we get to do. It's the most personal thing. Oh, it should be the most personal thing is having a baby, right? You should be able to shut a door, get under a cover, turn the lights off and only you and your partner know what you're doing. Yeah. It's so is, private. Yeah. It's so private, right? And we get to be part of the most the most private the most personal part of these people's lives their whole lives you know and that I mean I feel tearful saying it it's it's profound and we have to and I've always said this when I when I've employed people start along the way you know this is what you you know if you're new in this field this is what you need to get this isn't just somebody coming in for a knee surgery you're invading their private life so you, you take the back seat in this, you know, they are like, you, 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 you've got to find their way of getting through this. Now, some people are fine with it and, but others are just like, do you know what, this is, I don't even, I don't want to share this with you. I, did, I don't, nobody wants to be in that fertility clinic, right? You do yeah. not want to be there. You know, no one would choose to be in there taking your pants yeah. off. You know, here we go again. I, I mean, God's sake, you know? Yeah. And, 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 you know, when you have somebody sitting in that, in that, in that chair with their legs in the stirrups and you're mm. not, you know, if you're not being 
absolutely respectful of what that person is in their mind right now. They're sitting there and they've done this. They've had to do this so many times. Uh, you know, I think that's what I've always tried to impart with people. That's what I always feel like this is, it's not privilege is the wrong word because it's not, it's not right, you know, that someone should be there. But I feel, I feel like I get how unpleasant this is. So I want to try and make that better in any way that I can. Can. And I think that's what most of the people I work with, if not all of them, get that. Thank you. I think many of the listeners will resonate with what you just said and really appreciate mm. that, um, that yeah. kind of support and respect. Mm. And as a wrap up, Julia, for anyone listening right now, currently on their journey, navigating that fertility journey, trying to grow their family, what would you tell them? Wow, that's a big question, right? Because it does, it really depends on them, where they are in their place. You know, if they're in the beginning of that time, then this is exciting. I mean, it's not exciting, but it's, you're at the start and you've got everything stacked for you. So keep the hope alive. This is, this is great. You're making the right step, you know, move forward, make, right. um, try and speak to, because many people get stuck thinking they need help but don't even know how to make that first step. You know, if you're even worried about well, when is it that I should start seeking help? When should I go to a professional? When should I talk to somebody? Make that leap, put it in your diary. Say next Monday, I'm going to call somebody or I'm going to make that start because many people sit and wait a long time. And, and, and it might be that you can wait a bit more, but go get some help or support to make those decisions. If you're in the middle of the journey and you're getting worn down by it, yeah, just keep talking to people, keep, you know, share as much as you can. Um, please get in touch with us, but I don't want to, you know, pressure anyone to do that. But I we're here for you if if we can. But you know, find your people, find, find the people around you, surround yourself with good people. And those people that are not bringing you the the right thing that you need. Don't be afraid to just put those boundaries up for now, cut them off or be clear to your families. You know, you're not talking about this. Be, you know, it's really hard to say be strong, but if you're not getting the support you need from whoever it is that you can't avoid, like your family, then then just be really clear. You know, I'm, I'm putting a boundary on this conversation for the next year. Could you please not ask me anything anymore? Um, you know, it, it's so personal. So it's very hard to give a generic message, but I'm, I I feel for you. That's probably the one thing I want to say. I feel for you. And I just genuinely, genuinely hope that uh, that you have some good news in the next few months. That's, you know, it's all I can say, I suppose, without looking someone in the eyes and knowing their journey. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Julia. It's really been amazing listening to you and seeing all that the experience that you have. But all that you're offering with IVF Guide, I think it is a game changer uh, for many people that would uh, seek out your support and help through as they navigate their journeys. It really is important to find people around you that understand that can support you and help you um, explore the right clinics, know the right questions to ask. And be with it, be with you every step of the journey, which is really important. So thank you for what you're doing and what you've provided to patients across the globe. And we thank look forward you, to having you again in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely.